I thought I would take just a little bit to talk about some famous or or really big hurricanes. Um, since we're in the U.S., we have to talk about Hurricane Katrina, obviously. So Hurricane Katrina occurred in 2005. That was a record-setting year. That was the only year that the um, there were too many hurricanes and they ran out of names and had to move to the Greek letters. There were a lot of major, major hurricanes um, that particular year, but Katrina had by far the worst effects. Now, Hurricane Katrina actually made landfall twice in the United States. It crossed across Florida um, and made landfall as a Category 1 storm, so it wasn't too bad. But when it got into the Gulf of Mexico, it was able to strengthen up fairly quickly. At one point, I believe it actually reached category four or maybe five out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico in those warm water eddies. Um, lucky enough, it weakened right as it was making landfall and made landfall in Louisiana as a category three three hurricane. This is one of the deadliest hurricanes um, in U.S. history. Uh, the total is somewhere around 1,836 that are left dead. At the time, it was the sixth strongest Atlantic hurricane. It ended up flooding out 80% of New Orleans. Now, when we think of Hurricane Katrina, we tend to think of New Orleans, although they were not the only area affected. The hurricane itself did much, much more damage um, in the areas outside of New Orleans, like past Christensen. Um, but New Orleans gets the attention because of the severe flooding that happened after the hurricane had already passed. New Orleans is a city that's surrounded by water. You can see in this image on one side of sort of the downtown area is Lake Pontchartrain. On the other side is the Mississippi River, and it is also not far at all from the Gulf of Mexico as well. This image is from Time Magazine, and it shows you the entire area that ended up underwater um, because of the flooding, and you can see there are red circles to show the major breaches along the levees in town that, when they failed, actually flooded out the city. Now, this particular storm is well known for the victims and the people who survived the storms, um, either waiting it out on their rooftop, waiting for um, rescue, or fleeing to the uh, Superdome once their homes flooded. Now, unfortunately, the Superdome wasn't actually set up to help people. Um, it quickly lost power during the storm. It wasn't supposed to necessarily be a shelter. Um, part of the, wind, the roof blew away and they lost power. And so the thousands of people in it, in the middle of the storm, um, uh, were in pretty horrific conditions. But it didn't have to be this bad. So the biggest problem was how um, New Orleans is situated. So if you look at the oldest parts of New Orleans, that's the French Quarter. The French Quarter also happens to be the highest in elevation. And what we know is the French Quarter did okay. Um, during Hurricane Katrina and in the devastation afterwards. But the places that were affected, this is a topographic profile um, from point A over to point B. So basically from the Mississippi to Lake Pontchartrain. Now, what I want you to notice is that there are levees that are built or a flood wall over here that's built to hold back the Mississippi River. So the surface... <laughs> is a little more than 10 feet above um, above sea level. The Mississippi is higher than that. And the, um, the wall built here goes up to 23 feet above sea level. On the other side, you have this flood wall and levee holding back Lake Pontchartrain. And the highest point of Lake Pontchartrain is about 10 feet above sea level. But if we look at where sea level is and you see how much of the city of New Orleans 
is below sea level, let alone <laughs> below um, the levels of both Lake Pontchartrain and the Mississippi River. So the only thing protecting this entire part of the city, even on a good day, are these levees. Um, but unfortunately, what happened is there was so much water that came into New Orleans. And as the water rose, it was able to erode and it eroded around these flood walls and the levees. And so it really was the failure of the flood walls and the levees that were the problem. So that erosion actually occurred even under the levees. There was so much water, it actually dug under the levees and just sort of picked them up. And all the water rushed in um, to those low-lying areas. And at that point, when you're the lowest area, that water can't leave at all. And so those are the areas that were flooded the worst. Um, so you can see this is an image from the area of where one of those levees was breached. So it's a delicate balance um, between these, you know, natural water features and natural storms that happen and these man-made areas. Those areas below sea level should be swamped, but they have been drained um, to put in more housing. Now, if we sort of think about, you know, who a victim or a survivor, whichever way we want to call them, um, of, of Hurricane Katrina, a lot of times they're very poor and they're black. And one of the reasons why is these areas that they lived were so dangerous because you're poor and you're black have been pushed into these really cheap because they're really dangerous areas. Um, and so it's, it's unfortunate that the system set them up that way. And of course, there is also kind of media coverage as well, because not everybody um, that was affected by Hurricane Katrina fits that profile, obviously, but that's the one that we've saw the most of. And so that's the, the image that's kind of imprinted on us as a society now. Um, but these areas are super cheap because it's dangerous. So the land sells really cheap. They were drained so that homes could go in there. And at this point, um, New Orleans isn't much better off than they were um, because they just sort of, you know, once the water was gone, they built new levees except it's sinking. That area is sinking fairly quickly thanks to uh, a number of different issues, but now the levees are pretty much back in the condition they were prior to Hurricane Katrina, which, which is quite unfortunate. Now, of course, Katrina is the, one of the costliest um, of the hurricanes in the United States and one of the deadliest, but I think it's worth mentioning a few other big storms um, for instance, Hurricane Andrew. So as I've mentioned before, there are only four Category 5 hurricanes to make landfall as a Category 5 um, in the United States. The first one on record was the Labor Day Hurricane of 1935, and I mentioned the World War I vets that were affected by that one. The second one was Hurricane Camille in 1969. The third one, and um, what stood as the third, you know, the only other one for a very long time was Hurricane Andrew that hit um, Florida in 1992. Um, this was uh, mainly affected Southern Florida and parts of Louisiana. It accounted for 40 deaths and over $30 billion worth of damage. Over a quarter million people were left homeless and it destroyed or damaged over 82,000 businesses. Um, and so this was uh, quite a storm, but um, lucky for Florida, it made landfall fairly far south. So it missed some of the um, larger metropolitan areas. But we're going to move on to a little bit more recent to Hurricane Harvey, which made landfall in 2017. Um, it was a category four when it made uh, its first landfall. So you can see in the map here, it actually came, uh, it crossed over the Yucatan Peninsula um, as only a tropical storm. It warmed up and got nice and big once it got into the Gulf of Mexico. 
It made landfall the first time in Texas as a Category 4 and a second time in Louisiana as a Category 3. So Texas and Louisiana was the most, were the most impacted by this particular storm. And, and for the most part, we think of Houston, Texas as sort of where this storm had the biggest effect. Although you can see this image, this is Port Arthur, um, all flooded out. And notice that's after it's passed. So that's the water that is still there. This is the wettest hurricane on record in the United States. Um, if you sort of look at the places that it crossed, they averaged about 40 inches of rainfall, which is a lot. That's as much as a lot of these areas get in a whole year. Um, but in Nedland, Texas, they actually peaked out at about 60 inches of rain from the, uh, from the storm. But that's mostly because the storm kind of slowed down right there. So it had a lot more time to dump a lot more water <laughs> while it was stuck there. Um, let's see. It is tied for Katrina for the costliest U.S. hurricane um, with cost of somewhere around $125 billion in damages. Interestingly enough, though, and, and the one of the... One of the people who got a lot of attention in the aftermath was Houston Texans defensive lineman J.J. Watt. He's, a, he's well liked in Houston. Um, he created a, a fundraiser in which they raised over $37 million. And my understanding is that a lot of it was paid to buy supplies and stuff directly for the people who needed. Um, help the most, which is pretty awesome. Um, he ended up receiving the Walter Payton NFL Man of the Year Award because of his efforts for this. Now, one of the reasons, there was a number of things that made Hurricane Harvey so devastating. Number one, it did hit one of the largest urban areas in the United States, um, that Houston area. But it's also a fairly quickly growing area and urban and suburban development have caused loss of wetland areas recently through the last few decades in this area. And those wetlands play an important part of kind of absorbing the water from hurricanes. But once you build buildings and homes and streets and Walmart parking lots and cover those wetlands with concrete, the water's got nowhere to go. Um, there have been some wetland areas that have seen as much as 75% of the area lost in just the last few decades, which is a, a pretty big loss. Um, there have been 7,000 residences built in the 100 year floodplain between 2010 and 2017. Um, and the aftermath of Harvey also really questioned how good those FEMA maps are because there were a lot of places that flooded out pretty severely that were not included in those um, flood maps. And so kind of understanding how those flood maps are created and um, who benefits from them not showing areas in a floodplain um, were actually really called into question. And I think there's still kind of some, some lasting effects of that at this point. Um, at this point, they were having unseasonably warm water off the Houston coast. So for this time of year, it was too, it was warmer than normal. Um, but the waters off of Houston have also risen by about half a degree centigrade in the last couple of decades, too. So the water was particularly warm when the hurricane um, moved through. But it's also just warmer in general over time as well. One other major feature is because is um, subsidence, and we'll talk about subsidence in this course as well. But basically, that means the land is sinking, and for Houston, the land is sinking because they're pumping a lot of groundwater out of the ground, and that causes um, that causes collapses underground, and everything sinks. And the lower you are in topography, the worse the flooding is going to be. Hurricane Irma happened in 2017 as well. This was a particularly nasty um, hurricane season. There's a really interesting picture here. This doesn't happen too very often, but on September 17th of 2017, there were three active hurricanes caught in one image here. Um, in the Gulf and the Caribbean, you have Katcha, Irma, and Jose. Jose. 
um, going across. But the most affected here were um, along the Caribbean and the Virgin Islands. Um, in the British Virgin Islands, the storm was so severe that um, it damaged a prison and 100 prisoners were able to escape and they, they had to go on a big mission to go and find them. Um, the storm caused catastrophic damage in Barbuda, St. Bartholomew, St. Martin, Anguilla, and the Virgin Islands as a Category 5 hurricane. And it caused at least 134 deaths. Um, so after it, it killed everybody there, it took a glancing blow at Puerto Rico and headed on into Florida. Um, for only the fifth time in its history, Walt Disney World completely shut down from September 9th to, through September 12th because of the fear of storm damage. Now, it seems kind of quaint right now <laughs> that it was closed down for three whole days, um, considering it is the year 2020 right now. Um, but at the time, that was a really big deal. Universal Studios um, and SeaWorld in Orlando also closed, as well as the Kennedy Space Center. A record 6.5 million Floridians evacuated from their homes, making it the largest evacuation in Florida history. Um, just in Florida, 84 people died from storm-related incidents, though. Half of those were from drowning, trauma, and carbon monoxide poisoning, surprisingly enough. Um, out of those folks, though, there were 12 that died in the rehabilitation center at Hollywood Hills. It is a nursing home um, in Hollywood, Florida that houses um, both the elderly and, and people in need of rehabilitation before returning home. Um, but 12 people died there from the heat because it knocked out their power and their electricity. Now, one of the things that was sort of interesting is just how big Hurricane Irma was. Um, this picture here actually is comparing Hurricane Irma when it was out um, kind of passing um, past Puerto Rico and um, the Dominican Republic and Haiti compared to the size of Hurricane Andrew that was a Category 5 storm that hit Florida. And you can see Irma wasn't quite as... Um, well, it, did, it didn't hit Florida as a Category 5, but it did while it was further south. But you can see the storm here is much, much bigger. Now, we are not done with 2017 yet. Next, you had Hurricane Maria. Now, Hurricane Maria was a Category 5 hurricane that devastated Dominica, St. Croix, and Puerto Rico. Um, this happened in September, and Maria is regarded as the worst natural disaster in recorded history to affect the islands. Out of everywhere, it was probably Puerto Rico that took the brunt of this storm. Initially, the death toll for Puerto Rico was listed as 64 people killed during the hurricane. Almost a year after the hurricane, though, Puerto Rico, the Puerto Rican government asked researchers at George Washington University to look at their death rate. And what they found was um, they, they counted up the excess mortality attributed to Maria both in both direct and indirect fatalities. Now, one of the hard parts for Puerto Rico is they had already been hit by Hurricane Irma two weeks prior. And 80,000 people were still without power when Maria hit them. FEMA's Caribbean Distribution Center warehouse um, was its only emergency stockpile in the island at the time um, and located in Puerto Rico. But, uh, but um, they did not have many of, the isle of their items left because most of it had already been deployed for relief um, post Irma, specifically to the U.S. Virgin Islands. 
And so the Maria actually came quick enough after her uh, after Hurricane Irma that they weren't able to restock the supplies. Two weeks after Hurricane Irma hit St. Thomas and St. John as a Category 5 hurricane, Hurricane Maria's weaker outer eye wall was reported to have crossed St. Croix while the hurricane was at Category 5 intensity. It killed two people, both in their homes. One person drowned and another was trapped by a mudslide. A third person there had a fatal heart attack during the hurricane and the death is attributed to the hurricane itself. After both hurricanes, the office of the Virgin Island Congresswoman Stacy Plaskett stated that 90% of the buildings in the Virgin Islands were damaged or destroyed and 13,000 of those buildings had lost their roof. And then it moved in on Puerto Rico. The hurricane completely destroyed the island's power grid and it left all 3.4 million residents without electricity. 95% of cell phone networks were down and 48 of the island's 78 counties, their, their networks, uh, phone network was completely inoperable. Three months after the hurricane, 45% of Puerto Ricans still had no power and that's over 1.5 million people. By the end of January 2018, approximately 450,000 people remained without power um, island-wide. Now, one thing to sort of remember in this case is that Puerto Rico is actually a U.S. territory, and the people that live here are Americans, even though the the government basically runs itself, they are still sort of under the protection of the country that they're a part of. And there was a lot of backlash about um, the U.S.'s kind of lack of aid to Puerto Rico. But because so many people were left without power for so long, that causes a lot of problems to go months and months without any electricity. So that's why um, the leaders there asked the George Washington University to look at their death toll. And what they found is the direct fatalities were around 64 people. But in the, um, but if you look afterwards and the after effects, and that's from not being able to get medication, from being, uh, from the heat, from exposure, from the lack of water, um, from depression and PTSD after so many storms, from suicides that happened by being um, so beaten down during this, um, during this time, that the death toll went from 64 to an estimated 2,975 people killed in Puerto Rico. That makes it the second deadliest natural disaster in United States history. And one more for us before we hit the road here, because Hurricane Michael made landfall in the Florida Panhandle in 2018. Now, the Florida Panhandle doesn't get hit by hurricanes almost ever, really. Um, but it made landfall near the town of Mexico Beach, Florida on October 10th. It was the first Category 5 hurricane to strike the um contiguous United States since Andrew in 1992. And it's the first Category 5 hurricane on record to impact the Florida panhandle. So if you remember, those four Category 5 hurricanes was hurricane the Labor Day hurricane, Hurricane Camille in 1969, Hurricane Andrew in 1992, and Hurricane Michael in 2018, just a couple of years ago. There were at least 74 deaths from this storm, 59 of them in the United States. It caused an estimated $25.1 billion in damages in 2018 money. Um, one of the areas where a lot of that damage occurred was Tyndall Air Force Base, where um, 
damage to U.S. fighter jets had a replacement cost of $6 billion. Um, there was a McDonald Douglas F-15 Eagle and a General Dynamics F-16 Fighting Falcon on display, both of which were flipped over during the storm and pretty badly damaged. There were 17 Lockheed Martin F-22 Raptors that were on base when Hurricane Michael hit. Those were relatively unscathed, luckily enough, and they were brought up to airworthy condition when only a few days. A maximum gust of 139 miles per hour was measured at Tyndall Air Force Base before the sensors failed completely. <laughs> so um, it is likely to have honestly been much worse than that. The combination of Michael's storm surge and the high tide happening at the exact same time submerged normally dry areas under 9 to 14 feet of water along the coast between the Air Force Base and Port St. Joe, Florida. The image you see here is from Mexico Beach, Florida. This is basically where it made landfall and had some of the highest devastation. And if you look closely, you can see a yellow arrow at the top of the image pointing to the same location. And so pretty much every single home you see here in the image was destroyed. I'm going to backtrack just a little bit to Galveston, Texas. Galveston hit was hit by a hurricane in the year 1900. Often this is referred to as the Great Galveston Hurricane, but at the time they tended to just call it the Great Galveston Flood. Um, city leaders did not really want to acknowledge that there was a hurricane because those are scary and dangerous. So they really did just refer to it as a flood to downplay the severity of the storm. Um, because they didn't want to scare people and investors with money away. This storm goes down in history as the deadliest hurricane in U.S. history, um, as well as actually the deadliest natural disaster to ever strike the United States. There were officially 3,406 dead. Most of that, though, is from recovered bodies. There are estimates of eight to ten thousand possibly dead because of this storm made landfall as a category four so it wasn't even as strong as it possibly could have been one of the problems is their local meteorologist really downplayed how um, vulnerable galveston really is to hurricanes this slope um the offshore slope coming up to galveston is actually fairly gentle um, and that leads to a lot higher storm surge. And so people were not ready for this to happen. Um, the entire island of Galveston is about nine miles long and about one mile wide. It's basically a sandbar that sort of <laughs> got big enough to put a town on. In 1900, it was one of the largest economic centers between the Mississippi and um, San Francisco. It was a bustling town, um, major port area coming into Houston and Texas too. But the storm left it completely devastated. What ended up happening is the storm surge um, destroyed like one block of town and then kept pushing all those buildings and took out the next one and pushed those and took out the next row of buildings, leaving very, very few things unscathed. You can see here, this is an image of some of the damage in the aftermath. This is a map that was created um, to show just how much was destroyed. If you look here, you can see the Gulf of Mexico is on the bottom of the map here. So we're looking sort of at the south side. And the north side of Galveston Bay is facing um, mainland Texas and kind of up into Texas City and Houston. And you can see the crosshatch stuff in the middle here. These buildings right here were completely destroyed and the rest of them were severely damaged. It left almost nothing. You can see in the picture, um, 
going towards the beach and the, the background of this image, everything from 12th Street to 1st, First Street is just completely gone. Now, one of the hard parts about this storm is there were a lot of people that were killed. I mentioned there were sub somewhere over 3,400 bodies recovered, and a lot of them were caught inside this debris. And so somebody had to go dig them out and do something with the bodies. Um, the people here carrying the bodies were not there of their own accord. A lot of times what happened is um, the more wealthy um, white part of the population would at gunpoint force the um, the black and Mexican communities that lived there to come and do sort of the dirty work. Um, they were lucky enough to get lots and lots of booze. And so what they did is as they, as they collected the bodies, they put them on boats and they took them out and weighted them down and gave them a uh, burial at sea. Except apparently it's very hard to tie a weight to a body if you're really, really drunk. And a lot of the bodies washed back up onto shore, so they had to try again. And this time, um, instead of burying them at sea, because at this point there was there was no mortuaries, no uh, nothing, <laughs> nowhere to put the bodies on land in Galveston. What they ended up doing was... Um, piling it up and setting fire to them unfortunately the um the story goes that you can actually see these piles um and the fire and the smoke all the way from the mainland in texas there were a few places that did survive one of the famous images here is the bishop's palace you can um, see it in the picture on the left and this picture on the right is a mostly modern day image, at least from the last 20 years or so, of this exact same um, location. And so you can visit, they'll take you on tours through it. It's a, it's a beautiful, amazing place. Um, but it has been named as one of the most important Victorian buildings in America, which is uh, kind of cool. You can see all of the, all of this metalwork outside is actually wrought iron and um, it is not surviving the Texas coast very well at this point. So what this people of Galveston decided to do was two major engineering products. The first one was raise the whole damn city. Now, when that hurricane made landfall, the highest point in the city was about nine feet above sea level. And the storm surge was somewhere around 12 feet, at least when they got started. And so by the time the that the storm had passed, there was literally nothing that hadn't been underwater during the storm. So they decided just to raise the whole town um, by nine to 15 feet. And so they got a bunch of jacks, jacked up the building, then put brick up under it to hold it up. And then they'd fill in with uh, sand under it. And this picture shows a house waiting to be filled in under it. And on the right side of the image, you can see the new level and what Galveston looks like today. The other major project was building a seawall along the coast. Now the top of the seawall lined up with how high they were raising the town. So you can see in this picture on the left, um, the right side is the one facing the ocean and the left side is facing town. Once they were done with the raising of the elevation in town, um, the ground surface was actually even with the top of the seawall there to give you some idea about kind of how high it was going up. You'll notice the seawall is curved, and that way as waves hit the wall, the energy is sort of deflected up and back out into the ocean. On the right is a more recent picture, but not completely recent, but I wanted to sh give you kind of an idea of scale of this thing. So you can see the people walking around, the giant beach umbrellas, you can see cars up at the top of it. Um, that is not a little wall. <laughs> and those cars along the top are parked on the edge of what is known as Seawall Boulevard. So you can drive right down the edge of the seawall now if you so choose. Now, both of those were major engineering feats, and they would be completely undoable at this point in history, like in our time, because of how expensive it would be now. There's been talk about doing something similar for those low-lying areas in New Orleans, 
but they just can't justify the cost, particularly because um, the areas that need it the worst are some of the poorest areas, sadly enough. Um, so, but those projects were great for Galveston for a very long time. That was in 1900. Um, and the, the town fared through a handful of pretty good sized um, hurricanes after that, up until Hurricane Ike in 2008. Um, on the left side of this picture is one of the iconic images to come out of this hurricane. What you see here is a home um, that was built by a couple, um, Warren and Pam Adams. They lost their home during Hurricane Rita, and they decided when they rebuilt they wanted a house that could withstand a category five hurricane. So they actually contacted um, an engineer in Houston to design them a hurricane proof home. And looking at this picture, you can see just how doable that actually is. And the cost was higher, but not, um, not ridiculously higher than just building a normal home. What you can't see is the inside is completely gutted. And I believe they ended up losing the home anyway, because as you can see, everything around it was completely destroyed and condemned. And so they lost water, power, and um, road access to their home, but even though the home was fine. Um, so yeah, so, Hurricane Ike made landfall as a category two storm. So it had the winds um, that, were, that weren't as strong as one might expect for a pretty devastating hurricane, but the storm surge was much, much higher than expected. Um, and the storm surge was kind of closer to what you might expect in a hurricane five um, or a category five hurricane. Um, what you can see here is this is one uh some before and after shots just to show you how devastating the erosion from Hurricane Ike was in the devastation. Um, and you can see the yellow arrows pointing to the same locations in both of those pictures. Now, Texas has um, a law that says anything between the high tide and low tide lines along the beach actually belongs to the state. There are no privately held beaches in um, the state of Texas. Well, these, these homes weren't on the beach when they built them. But now, thanks to the erosion because of the storm, their houses ended up on the beach and they pretty much lost the land. Uh, the state of Texas took it. Oddly enough, that, was, that can actually happen, right? Um, this was, it, Hurricane Ike actually led to the largest evacuation in U.S. history. It also led to the largest search and rescue operation in U.S. history at the time. There were 940 people rescued from rising water. There were 2,000 people that were rescued afterwards and 37 people were left dead in the aftermath. Here's a couple more shots. Um, some of the really sort of famous locations along the coast of Galveston are the piers. Um, they've been rebuilt a number of times, but the piers were apparently started back during prohibition and the main part of the building that's way out in the ocean, in the water, um, where it was often big bars and gambling dens, neither one of which was legal at the time um, when they were built. But because the pier was so long to get out to it, when the cops or somebody would come to investigate, somebody would alert from the front a uh, pier when they first entered would alert the folks back in the main part of the building and they would hide everything before the police got there. So they were able to get away with it for quite a while. Um, in the picture you see on the left there, that is the Hotel Galvez. It was built in the aftermath of the 1900 hurricane as a way to show the world that Galveston was uh, still okay and is still a big, nice, ritzy place. Unfortunately, even after the 1900 storm, they didn't really recover. And Hurricane Act really did a doozy on the whole town as well. I show you Murdoch's um, because um, 
this is one of the places that really sits in my memory from when I was a kid. And every time I've ever visited Galveston, we always stop in at Murdoch's to get, you know, some souvenirs or buy some seashells or crap. Um, and it's always always super easy to recognize because of the giant clamshells out on the front walk. So you can see the damage to the building here on the right. Um, pretty much everything just kind of wiped off here and wiped away. Um, the picture on the left, that's, that's not a before picture. <laughs> that's like the after the after this is actually a fairly recent photo to uh, show you just how well they've rebuilt after hurricane ike though which i thought was uh pretty funny but here's you a couple more of those shots of the before and after murdoch's is actually in this building kind of down towards the bottom of those images that makes a big u shape um, so you can see what's left of it in that bottom image. And I, I just this picture, I, I get an odd sense of uh, schadenfreude. <laughs> is, that, is that what it is? It, um, buildings on fire while, while standing underwater. And I will show you these probably for just about every kind of water related hazard we talk about just because I think it's kind of funny um but yeah but you can see the the severity of the flooding here this shows you where a lot of the damage is um where the flood zone is and where the red is the buildings unsafe and the yellow are the ones that have restricted use and you can see that's that's quite a few of the buildings in uh, Galveston, unfortunately, the seawall covers only part of the Galveston Island and where a lot of the new builds have been built um, in fairly recent years, kind of running up to Hurricane Ike, was on the parts of the island that were left completely unprotected. And you can see where those were the ones that were, were damaged pretty severely. This is the Kima Pier. It's a kind of a little amusement park out on a pier where you can go and play i've got pictures of myself <laughs> at the top of that um ferris wheel pre-hurricane ike 